Hyferman have traditionally not made the best headphone amps, but that's all changed now. So let's talk about why the Hyferman Golden Wave Prelude here is one of the very best headphone amps you can buy for under US dollars I'll also tell you exactly which headphones I think pair beautifully with the Prelude, and the headphones that I think are better off paired with a different headphone amp. Coming in at US dollars the Prelude is a serious bit of headphone amplification and pre-amplification. It's a fully balanced, Class A design coming from Golden Wave, who have recently been purchased by Hyferman. If you haven't heard of Golden Wave before, they'd been known for quite some time as a maker of very good headphone amps, and they were purchased during 2023 by Hyferman. The preview, as I understand it, was once upon a time a pure Golden Wave brand, and now it's a combination branded Hyferman Golden Wave Prelude. What you're getting within the Prelude is an amplifier that's a full Class A design, as I've already mentioned, and one that can output 10 watts into a 32 ohm load meaning that it will then output about 6 watts into a 60 ohm load or a 64 ohm load, making it plenty powerful enough to drive any of the difficult headphones around. Hyferman Sasvara, Abyss 1266, Hyferman HE6SE, the new Modhouse Tungsten, which I haven't tried yet, but I'm hoping to. This one will absolutely handle them no problems at all. And in fact, it's still touting 1 watt of power into a 300 ohm load, so it's going to have plenty of power for any headphone you are ever likely to want to drive with it. Now, whether that equates to good sound quality, that's a whole other question, but I've already given that game away in the intro. This is a wonderful sounding headphone amp, depending on your tastes, and that's what I want to explain to you now. Before we do, though, let me give you a really quick device to it. There's not a lot to talk about. The first thing I'll say is that this thing weighs a ton. It is very, very heavy. Part of that's going to come down to the power supply inside here, but it's also a solid piece of aluminium to help reduce things like resonance and any kind of external interference from the environment. On the front of the Prelude, we've got a pair of 3-pin XLR combo jacks, meaning that you can either run a pair of 3-pins out into a headphone for a balance connection, or you can run two independent 6.3mm connections, one into each side, so it's going to run two single-ended or one balanced headphone out of here. And when I say balanced headphone, I mean a headphone wired for balanced connections. We've then got a 4-pin XLR connection and a 4.4mm balance connection too. Next to that, we've got a volume control. This is using a lovely quality Alps volume pot. I'll talk about the channel matching and the volume levels a bit later on in relation to IEMs. And then finally, over here, we've got a beautiful clean white display that gives you basic information like which input you're using, which output mode you're in, whether it's in preamp mode or headphone mode, and then of course, which gain setting you're on as well. This has got two gain levels, low and high. If we flip around to the back, we've then got a power input and the power switch. So this is the only place to turn it on and off. We've got 3-pin XLR and RCA outputs for the preamp, and then we've got RCA and 3-pin XLR inputs from your DAC. So as I said, nothing too dramatic to talk about here. The inputs and outputs are fairly minimal, not so much in terms of the front panel that's very fully featured, but in terms of the inputs on the back, you do only have a single pair of RCA and a single pair of XLR, whereas there's some other amps at the same price point, like the Burson Soloist 3X GT, that's going to give you two pairs of RCAs and two pairs of XLR, if that matters to you. But if you just care about how the Prelude sounds, let's dive into that now, because the short answer is it sounds sublime. It's a beautiful sounding amplifier at the price. In fact, a beautiful sounding amplifier full stop. It produces a sound that I'd describe as solid, refined, with a little bit of warmth, but plenty of detail and separation. It's not a thick sounding amplifier, but I do think it's just a touch warmer than what many people would consider to be truly neutral. It produces a wonderful sense of space and separation in the soundstage, as well as imaging focus. And one of the things that really stands out from the Prelude is it just has a wonderful authoritative sense of control over any headphone or IEM you plug into it. And yes, it will drive IEMs happily, as I'll talk about soon. As is often the case with headphone amps and preamps, it's very hard to explain the sound of a headphone amp or a preamp without a comparison, I think. I always think it's best to give you an idea of where it sits in a continuum of other products. And so I'm going to get to a comparison in just a moment, but before I get there, there's just a few side details that I thought you might want to know about the Prelude if you're considering buying one. The first thing is to say that the single-ended outputs, which is those combo jacks with the 3-pin XLR, those produce a sound that's just a little bit smoother than the balanced outputs, but no less enjoyable. If you've seen my review of the Serenade, it's kind of the same story here as well. By sharing the common ground, it does change the presentation a little bit. If you don't know what common ground means, that's the fact that when you go to a 3-pin XLR, you've got a left, a right, and a common shared ground for the negative. Whereas if you're talking about a 4-pin XLR, you've got right positive, right negative, left positive, and left negative, so the right and left channels kind of never meet. What that means is that when they do meet in a single-ended connection, you often do get a slightly different character, and that's true here, but not a loss in quality, and that's the key. The other good news is that the RCA and the XLR inputs both perform identically. I would challenge anyone to try and pick the difference between them. And then if we come back around to the volume that I mentioned briefly before, 
The great news there is that firstly, it's very well channel matched right down to the very bottom, meaning that if you are using IEMs or very sensitive headphones and you have to operate in a low volume range, it very quickly gets to the point where your left and right channels are identical. There's a teeny tiny bit of imbalance at the very, very bottom, but it goes away very fast and there's just enough range to make it usable, even on sensitive IEMs. And that's running the balanced XLR inputs, which are going to be higher volume still because of the extra voltage coming in. So I describe the volume range for IEMs and super sensitive headphones as limited, but usable. And then for everything else, it's got everything you need in terms of power, volume range, quality of the volume control, the interaction and the interface is wonderful. Everything going for the prelude in that regard. And so that brings us into the world of comparisons. One of the things I've often done in the past is compare headphone amps to the headphone output on the Cord Hugo TT2 because it's a very transparent output. And on this occasion, I'm not exactly going to do that. And the reason for that is that you might be looking for a dedicated headphone amp. You might be tossing up different ones. And so instead, I'm going to put the Prelude up against the Burson Solo 3X GT. Now, the version of the GT that I'm talking about is the 2023 version, and that means it's able to be upgraded with better power control chips, with the supercharger power supply. And so think of the comparison version that I'm doing here as fully loaded. It's got the SPO2 power chips, and it was run with the 5 amp supercharger, meaning that it's about a $3,000 total package. So we're putting a $3,000 version of the Soloist GT up against the Prelude, and that's being driven by the Lumen D3 streamer over behind me, feeding into the Cord M scaler, which is then in turn going to the TT2 and out to both amps. I decided to drive the Meza Elites for this part of the testing, but don't worry, I've got lots of other headphone content about the Prelude and how it pairs with things coming up, so we'll get to that shortly. And then the final thing I'll say, just to connect back to what I said about the TT2 and its transparent headphone stage, is that what I hear from the Soloist in its fully upgraded state is an output that's very similar to what you get from the TT2. It's probably just a little tiny bit smoother, and I mean smooth in the sense of still having all the texture and resolution, but maybe being just a little bit less dry, a little bit less clinical than the output from the TT2 can be, for better and worse. And so what that means is we're essentially comparing the Prelude to a very neutral source, a very neutral sounding headphone amp. To help me explain this comparison, I'm going to refer to a single track, but do rest assured I use lots of different tracks in my time with the Prelude. I'm actually going to be producing soon a full video of an end-to-end -end review process so you can see what's involved when I actually review some gear. But rest assured there's been lots of tracks used, and by the way subscribe if you want to see that end-to-end -end video of what goes into a review. But for now, rest assured there's been lots of different tracks used to produce this end result of my impressions, but I'm going to use a single track to focus in on some details for you. The track I used to make my notes was Midsummer Girl by Razorlight. And the first thing I'd have to say is that between the Prelude and the Burson Soloist 3X GT fully upgraded, the performance is pretty much equal. I don't think anyone could sit there and say this one is better than this one from a technical perspective. Subjectively, yes, as we'll get to, but not technically. Where the differences do start to become obvious is there's a richer tonality or timbre from the Prelude. It's a little tiny bit warmer than the Soloist. What that also means is that the Prelude produces a soundstage that's a little bit narrower. It's not closed in or congested in any way, but you do become aware as you jump between the two that the Soloist spreads the soundstage wider. There is also a greater sense of texture coming from the Soloist, but again that's more about where the emphasis is placed rather than saying it's better or worse. All the same texture and detail and resolution is present in the Prelude, it's just put forward to you a little bit differently and not quite as obvious. You have to listen for it a bit more, whereas in the Soloist, it is a little bit more upfront. Again, not in your face, but a bit more available. A part of the different presentations of these two is that when you're listening to the Prelude, it's going to bring the vocal slightly closer to you. And that might initially sound bad. It might sound like it's getting in your face. It's definitely not. And then the positive of that is that it actually creates a little bit more layering and depth in the soundstage. The Soloist is already very good for layering and depth. I think the Prelude might be just a touch better. And so essentially what you can think of is that if the soloist is producing a large rectangular or maybe it's a spherical or hemispherical room, it's like when you go to the prelude, it's narrowing that room a little bit and making it a bit longer and further away from you. And so whilst the vocalist might take a half step forward towards you, the rest of the instruments take a half step back. Again, it's not a huge, vast change, but I do think the prelude is a bit narrower and a bit deeper comparatively. Something else that I noticed as I listened, and this kind of harks back a little bit to what I said about the tonality, is that I feel like the Soloist 3XGT puts a bit more emphasis into the treble in the music, 
whereas the Prelude puts the emphasis into the vocals and the mid-range. And some are going to prefer that kind of slightly brighter, crisper sound that the soloist has. Others will like the emphasis and the weight going into the mid-range. And I'm kind of neither here nor there. I think both are fantastic. And the key thing for me, and the key thing to share with you, is that I found that from track to track, I prefer one over the other, and from headphone to headphone too. And so that's really, I think, the best summary that I can give you of the Soloist 3XGT, which is in the rack over there, that's why I keep pointing over there, and then also the Prelude. Both are, in my opinion, at exactly the same level of performance, and it comes down to preference and track choice as to which one pulls ahead. And so there's a couple of ways that you could choose between them. One of them is going to be depending on your headphones, I'll get to that in a moment. Another thing to consider is that the Soloist offers you more input options. It's also got a subwoofer output if that matters to you. It's also smaller. It doesn't get quite as hot. But in terms of not getting hot, it's because it's got a fan built in, and some people I know are not a fan of the fan. No pun intended. Now, in case you're wondering why I'm not talking about the new Soloist Voyager here, which is the next level up again, I didn't have that here for long enough. I had a short-term loan of the prototype. It will be coming back around, and I will be comparing it with the Prelude and with the Soloist 3XGT 2023 version. So again, make sure you subscribe if you want to catch that one. But thinking for now just about the Prelude versus the Soloist 3XGT, if you don't want a fan, if you don't need as many inputs, if you're happier to have a larger sized amplifier that's more wide than it is deep, so overall this is a bigger footprint, it's a wider amp, it's almost as deep as the Soloist 3XGT, not quite, but it also does run very hot. This is a true Class A design, it is going to get warm. It's not warm to the point that I can't leave my hand on it when it's been running, but when I do put my hand on it, I know it's warm, there's no doubt about that. So keep that in mind, if you don't want a hot running amp and you're happy to have a fan, the Soloist GT is the better choice. But if it's purely about sound quality, then it's going to come down to which tonality you like more, and then which pairing of headphones you're going to want more. So let's jump now into talking about which headphones I thought paired better and worse with the Prelude and the Soloist GT. The headphones I used for most of my testing were the Meza Elites running with the angled Alcantara pads. And I'd honestly say that with those headphones, both amps are equally enjoyable. I couldn't split between the two, no matter which tracks I was listening to, what genres I was listening to, it was always a great listen. Moving over then to the Focal Utopia 2022 edition, which I also adore, I've reviewed them relatively recently if you want to know my thoughts on them. But the Utopia 2022 has got a slightly different kind of attack and energy compared to the Elites. And because of the way it delivers the sound, because of the way it balances its tonality, the Prelude was the amp that I definitely enjoyed with the Focals more. For me, the Soloist was putting just a little bit too much energy into the upper mids and the treble, and it brought forward too much of those frequencies from the Focal Utopia because of its starting tuning. Whereas the Prelude balanced it off better, gave it a bit more weight in the mid-range, and it was just sublime to listen to. And so, so far what we're seeing is that a slightly brighter tuning headphone, a slightly more clinical or analytical sounding headphone, not that the Utopia is particularly clinical, but it's a bit less kind of romantic or euphoric than the Elites. I think that's where the Prelude does start to come into play as balancing those headphones off a bit better perhaps. From there, I moved over to the ZMF Calderas. So these have got an interesting tuning in that they're a bit weightier and a bit chunkier than either the Elites or the Utopias. And yet... It was actually the Prelude that I still enjoyed a little bit more with the Calderas. Both headphone amps were great, but the Prelude took the edge, and the reason it did was that the Calderas have a little bit of extra upper mid-range energy that sometimes goes a step too far for me. Now, I run my Calderas without the mantle, which is a little add-on piece that can go over the front of the drivers and pull back some of the upper energy. I like the energy they bring without the mantle, but I do like it kind of tamed slightly by the Prelude compared to the Soloist, which just lets it run free. I'd say with the Calderas, it's not as clear-cut as the Utopias. With the Utopias, every time I'd reach for the Prelude, with the Calderas, it's probably 80% Prelude, 20% Soloist, maybe even less than that, maybe 70-30, but I did find myself preferring the Prelude overall with the Calderas. Going over to another ZMF headphone in the Atrium, which is a much warmer, richer tuning. It's a dynamic driver now compared to the planar magnetic in the Caldera. Not that that seems to matter in terms of which amplifier pairs better, but in terms of the tuning, the rich, warm tuning of the Atrium, that took things just a little bit too far with the Prelude. Again, it's not to say the Prelude is overly rich or warm or thick, but the Atriums don't need anything else there. Even though I love them with the shit Folkvanger, that's not so much for the richness and lushness of the tubes in the Folkvanger, so much as other characteristics. When it came down to the Prelude and the Soloist, it was the Soloist that I felt was bringing the energy of the atriums to life. They've got a wonderful ability to articulate the upper registers despite their warmer tuning, and that's where the Soloist allowed them to do that to their best. 
And then finally, I went over to the HE1000 SE from Heiferman, and the Prelude had it hands down there again. The reason for that is that again, we've got a headphone in the HE1000 SE where the treble's a little bit more forward. I also feel like the HE1000 SE is a little bit more left right in the staging. And so the balance of the staging characteristics, that slightly narrower, slightly deeper presentation with the natural tuning of the HE1000 SE, that made for a wonderful combination of staging presentation and also tonal presentation. And so I think for anybody running a Heiferman headphone and looking at headphone amps, not because of the brand so much as because of the tuning, I think pairing them up with the Prelude would be a fantastic choice. And indeed, the same is true with the Serenade that I reviewed just recently, this last video that came out. The Serenade's another great choice for any Heifman headphones because it shares very much the same tonal qualities, spatial qualities even, as the amp stage in the Prelude. It's kind of like a, a shrunk down, simplified version of that in the Serenade, and therefore lots of what I'm saying here holds true, tonally speaking, for the Serenade. So I think if you have got a Heifman headphone and you're looking for an ideal amp pairing for it, the Prelude should absolutely be high on your list if this is the budget area you're looking at. But on the other hand, if you've got a warmer, richer headphone, or you like a slightly sparklier, more energetic top end, then that's where the Soloist 3XGT might still have an edge. Again, keeping in mind other things like the number of inputs, using the fan versus not using the fan, all that kind of stuff. But where all this leaves us is that the Hyperman Prelude headphone amp is an absolute beast. And by the way, the preamp stage is exactly as good as everything I've described from the headphone stage. I've been running this into a pair of Burson Timekeeper GTs, running my Harbeth P3 ESRXD speakers, and it's been an absolute joy there as well. Again, everything I described for the headphone stage, that holds true for the preamp. So if you are in the market for a top-end, potentially end-game headphone amp, I think it's very, very hard to go past the Prelude. And indeed, if you saw my recent review of the Sen Grand Silver Fox, which is another even larger headphone amp, even more powerful headphone amp, and one that does sound beautiful, I think, honestly, the Prelude is probably what the Silver Fox should have aimed to be. And that is that I think it's a bit more versatile. I think because it's got a better control over the noise, you can plug IEMs into it or difficult headphones into it. I think that, combined to the more compact form factor and the lower price, means that this is the amplifier that I would choose between the Silver Fox and the Prelude. And that's saying something because the Prelude is a four or four and a half thousand US dollar device. This is a two and a half thousand dollar device. It's not to say the Silver Fox is bad. I love that amplifier. It's a wonderful amp, but it's very, very big. And it's also going to suit very specific tastes. Whereas I think the presentation of the Prelude might be just a little bit more for everybody in some ways. And so if you do have a headphone or a preference for sound that aligns with what I've described from the Prelude, rest assured, you can't go wrong with this one, I don't think. It's a beautiful device. It's lovely to interact with. It looks great, I think. It sounds wonderful. And it's absolutely competing up there with 3,000 to 4,000 US dollar headphone amps. So if that sounds good to you, I'll put some links down below. I don't yet know if they're affiliate links. I haven't checked. If they are affiliate links to Amazon or Linsol or Appos, then thank you for using them. Thank you for any and all support. I deeply appreciate it. But regardless, check out the links down below. If you're in the market for one of these, I don't think you'd be disappointed. And so for now, I hope you found this video useful, helpful, and informative. If you have, please hit the like button and subscribe and ring the notification bell if you haven't already. But for now, let me leave it to the music. So happy listening, and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound.